Today is an exciting lecture because we're starting the section on moduli of stable curves after you know going through you know sites she used in stacks and then algebraic spaces in stacks and then the geometry of the lean mumford stacks we're at the fourth part of the course we're going to begin discussing mg and mg bar with the goal of showing projectivity of mg bar and uh we'll have around six or seven lectures on on the moduli of curves and today's focus uh is 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 mainly on nodal curves but before that i would like to take sort of a a, give a lengthy recap of the Kiyomori theorem and uh, and then we'll move on we'll, we'll give a refresher on smooth curves and then talk about nodes and nodal curves and to, to uh, recap here let me first just remind you of the definition of a, a course moduli space uh, I don't know why it's way down here so a coarse moduli space is uh, a morphism from an algebraic stack to an algebraic space that satisfies these two properties. One is that you know induces a, a bijection on all geometric points. In particular, the topological space of the stack is identified with the topological space of the algebraic space, and it also satisfies uh, a, a, a universal property for maps to algebraic spaces. You know, and uh, specifically, any other morphism to an algebraic space factors through the map 2x. And so we're interested in this because we, we, we are willing to sacrifice some of the universal properties of, of an algebraic stack in order to get a more familiar object. Here is just an algebraic space, but later we want to show that it's a projective variety in the case of mg bar. And uh, the main one of the main theorems, in fact, of the, of the entire course is this, is this Kiyomori theorem which I stated and proved last time. And let me, let's walk through the hypothesis here. We take uh, a Deline Mumford stack and uh, it's separated in finite type over an Ethereum base. And with those hypotheses, you can conclude that there exists a coarse moduli space. Uh, and then not only that, you have some other nice properties. You have this and uh, sort of very useful additional properties of the coarse moduli space map. And maybe I should highlight one of the key hypotheses here is the separated condition. Is that X is separated. Here, what that means, uh, remember with our definitions, uh, that is, it means that the diagonal is proper. But since X is Deline Mumford, we already know that the diagonal is quasi finite. Well, it's even unramified. And, and for, for a morphism of schemes, proper and quasi finite is equivalent to, to a finite morphism. So this implies even that, uh, that X is, for, for a Deline Mumford stack, uh, X is separated if and only if the diagonal is finite. And so, and, and later, we will show that the, the stack of smooth curves, as well as stable curves, which we'll define, uh, are separated. And we'll, we'll use the value of criterion but the upshot is that the Kiyomori theorem then implies that there exists a coarse moduli space where this is just an algebraic space at first. All right, and the Kiyomori theorem is one of the, I, I would say is one of the main theorems of the entire course. It's what lets us get, get started to construct an algebraic space that we then show as a, as a projective variety. And due to its importance, it, importance, and since I covered it last lecture, I'd like to give sort of a systematic review of the ingredients that went into the Kiyomori theorem. And at the same time, explain how, uh, how similar methods give, uh, give 
you know, the, the, the general Keel Moore theorem. All right, so I'm going to separate the, this next slide sort of into two different parts. You know, on the left hand side, I'm going to discuss the Deleen Mumford case of the Keel Moore theorem, which we discussed in detail uh, last Wednesday, and we gave a, a, almost a complete proof. And on the right hand side, I'll, I'll discuss the general Keel Moore theorem. And, the, the, and like the, the basic hypothesis and setup in both cases is that we have an algebraic stack that we're assuming is a finite type, and let's uh, a finite type over an Ethereum ring. Right, and to, let me, in the Kiyomori theorem, let me give a slightly different formulation than on the last page that, well, I'll, yeah, so I'll, I'll say that if the diagonal is unramified and finite, then there exists a course modular space. And keep in mind here, this the unramified condition is playing is playing the role it is is the is the condition that the stack is delete Mumford, and the, this finite is the condition that X is separated. But the general Kiyomori theorem is the following: that all you need is to know is that the inertia is finite. Then there exists a coarse moduli space. And uh, here, maybe let, let, me, let me just recall that uh, the, in the inertia is the fiber product over the diagonal. So certainly if the stack, so if X is separated, certainly the inertia is finite. And uh, right, and uh, but this distinction between the diagonal being being finite or the inertia being finite didn't really play a role in our proof. Like we could have we could have handled the inertia being finite. The main condition that we were really using was the um, was the uh, Deleen Mumfordness, namely that the diagonal was was unramified. Um, and yeah, in fact, there's even a more general version of this theorem. You can drop. You know the finite tightness hypothesis, and you can work over non-Ethereum bases, but yeah, you know, we'll we'll ignore that. Okay, so the, the, to to sort of summarize our proof, let me give sort of a sketch of the argument, you know, consisting of uh, several several components. So we're going to start with let's let X be a geometric point. Uh, with closed image. And so K, K is algebraically closed. And what we're trying to show is that there may be, that there's an open substack around uh, this point that admits a coarse modular space. And then we, and then we, we, we glue them all together. So the, the first step of this argument is one, well, let's just choose, let's let, U the U B an arbitrary smooth map, uh, a smooth neighborhood of our point. We know this exists because it's an algebraic stack, and you know, and uh, and and then, to, I mean, yeah, and then it's, it's, this was this is essentially the argument that we use to show that if the diagonal is unramified, then it's in fact a lean Mumford. What you do is you then slice. Uh, U to arrange that you have U to X to arrange that you actually have an Atal cover. And then by throwing away all the other preimages, you could arrange that uh, that you have a Cartesian diagram where the preimage of the residual gerb or the, the, the classifying stack of the field value point X is just a point where this is Cartesian. Right. And uh, in, the, in the more general case, in, in fact, the same exact argument, the same methods sh uh, shows that you can arrange to have a neighborhood that's not a tau, but it's at least quasi-finite 
and flat with the same Cartesian diagram. Okay. And now once you have an Italian neighborhood on the left-hand side, uh, that's actually, that, that's, how, that's what we used in order to, to construct a local quotient presentation. And it worked sort of as following. We, so we, we, well, first we let, let's let D be the size of the stabilizer group. You know, it's a, it's a finite group, abstract finite group. And then we considered the default fiber product of U over X, which is just U over X, da, da, da. Uh, and then we removed all the diagonals. So we defined W this way. This is just the complement of all the diagonals. And uh, so this is a, a quasi affine scheme and it, uh, it has a, an action by the symmetric group SD by permuting the factors. And we realized that the quotient stack parameterizes uh, diagrams where you know you have a uh, oh, the, like the, the 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 fiber category over a scheme S consists of a morphism to X. And a closed subscheme of the fiber product, such that this map is finite et al. And of degree D. And then what we showed was that the map from W mod SD to the stack X is a tau and representable. And moreover, yeah, that, that there, there was a point W mapping to X inducing an, an isomorphism of automorphism groups. Okay, and, and finally, okay, maybe I'm getting too detailed here. You can arrange by shrinking that W is affine. And if you want, you can, you can replace SD with the, with, with the stabilizer. All right. And that, 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 that was the argument giving us a, a local quotient presentations for Jolene Mumford stacks. And the, to handle the general Kiyomori theorem, you, you need a, a different argument. So you sort of, you replace this with something similar, but it's, it, it's, it's well, sorry, it's more technical. Let's zoom in. So you consider the Hilbert scheme or the relative Hilbert scheme, let's call it H, uh, parameterizing sort of diagrams. diagrams uh, so in, like the, an S value point of the stack is gonna correspond to first amorphism to X. And then a closed subscheme of the fiber product where this map is no longer a tau, but it's finite and flat and degree D. And, uh, but yeah, so you need to use this relative Hilbert scheme or, but it's, you know, since U over X is representable, there's no real issue in, in constructing this Hilbert scheme if you rely on the existence of Hilbert schemes for, for uh, in, in the case of schemes. And then once you have this, the universal family of the Hilbert scheme, what it gives is it gives a morphism from H to X, as well as a closed subscheme of the fiber product. Uh, let's call that W, such that this map is finite flat. And note that you can uh, since u to x is representable, w is even a it's a it's a it's a scheme, and you can even arrange it to be affine. And and moreover, this map here is what we what you've constructed. This map is a tau and representable, 
And sort of by construction, there is a point W in here mapping to X inducing an isomorphism of automorphism groups. So we're sort of in, in the same situation as in the delete Mumford case, but we've gone from these finite etals to finite flats. And we have an etal cover. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have an etal cover that's an honest quotient stack by a finite group. On the right-hand side, we have just, uh, H is just an algebraic stack, but it has a finite flat cover by an affine scheme. And that's gonna sort of play the analogous role of the quotient presentation. Okay, moving on. So here I, I just recapped the two versions of the theorem and in red, you see basically what stage we're at right now. And, and then the, now the arguments have really proceed along the same lines. So the next step was, uh, was to show that in the special case of a quotient stack that we have coarse moduli spaces. So we showed that if you have a finite group acting on an affine scheme, that the morphism to the invariance is a coarse moduli space. And note here that this is, this is the same as the global sections of the stack. Uh, and on, uh, an analogous argument on the, on the right-hand side is you need to show that stacks that have a finite flat cover by an affine scheme uh, have coarse moduli spaces. So here, right here we have H and we have a W which is affine and this map is finite flat. And if you take the fiber product R, then this is, you get a, a groupoid which is a finite flat groupoid. And what you need to show and in fact, it's a very similar argument. You do show that the morphism from H to its global sections uh, is a coarse moduli space. And, and keep in mind that this, this global sections here is identified with the eight R invariance of the ring A, namely functions on A such that the two pullbacks are equal. All right, so that was sort of the local case in both sides. Um, and then we needed to use the finiteness of the inertia. So the fourth step was to use that the inertia is finite to arrange that these local quotient pr presentations not only preserve the automorphism groups at the particular points, but preserve all stabilizer groups. That is, induce isomorphisms on stabilizers at all points. And this is where we use the finite of the inertia because that gave us, yeah. Uh, and on the, you know, on the right-hand side, it's, it's, it's the identical argument. And then in order to reduce, so this was one of the steps in the reduction to the local case. Uh, and then we needed to show, so we, we, we basically showed the following statement that is if you, if you have a morphism of DM stacks, let's say this is F that induces a map on coarse moduli spaces. So we're assuming existence of coarse moduli spaces here. That in this setup, we showed that if F is a tau, and preserves the stabilizer groups, then the induced map on quotients is a tau and the diagram is Cartesian. And, I'm, I, and again, this, this step is identical in the general case. And then the last step, putting everything together, we, you know, we have our stack X, where we're locally trying to construct a coarse moduli space around a particular point, we should, we, we, and we find in the tau neighborhood by a finite group, uh, such that you know with this we know we have a, a coarse moduli space, and if you take the 
like the corresponding groupoid of stacks, then you argue that this has a coarse moduli space, so Roman R. And then you show that that this is, show this is an Italic equivalence relation. And this implies that if, if yeah, this is Roman W, that this implies that W mod R is an algebraic space. And then if you, and then if you take, reduce to the case where this W is an, is a, yeah, uh, surjects onto X, then this quotient, this W mod R is the coarse moduli space we're after. And in the general case, it's, it's the identical argument. Right, so yeah, there you have it. That's a quick sketch of Kiyomori theorem. And it's a good time to stop for questions. What type of uh, conditions will guarantee that the course moduli space is a scheme? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, yeah, that's a difficult question. I mean, if you show it's projective, <laughs> then you know it's a scheme, but uh, yeah, that's sort of a, 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 a something that you often have to grapple with that it's, yeah. Um, yeah, we don't have that many methods at our disposal to show that algebraic spaces are, are schemes. I mean, you could show a line. A lot of the projectivity criterion, amplitude criterion for line bundles do ex extend to algebraic spaces. That helps. And another tool you can use is Zariski main, Zariski's main theorem, which is that uh, quasi-finite morphisms, quasi-finite and separated morphisms of algebraic spaces are quasi-affine. So that's also a way, that, a tool, a way you can show that an algebraic space is a scheme. But in general, it could be a difficult question. Other questions? Okay, so let's get on to curves. So I'm going to start slow. And we'll just start uh, with a re refresher on smooth curves. And since this is all familiar material that's either in Hartshorn or the Keel's notes, so uh, I'm going to kind of go quickly through the smooth case. But so I, I want to want to at least say something because when we introduce nodal curves and then stable curves, we want familiar properties. So we want analogous. Can, we want to generalize some of these some of these properties to. So first and, and foremost, what do we mean by a curve? So curves for us are always over. What, what we mean is is. Uh, a curve over a field is a is a just a pure one-dimensional scheme of finite type, and de people's definitions of curves vary. Like, what do you want to? Yeah, with this definition, is the spectrum of a DBR is not a curve, but uh, that's okay. So we, we have, a, uh, and then uh, if it's a proper curve, you you define the genus of 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 the curve by H1 of the structure sheath. And, uh, and we have these two general facts about curves that I just I'm kind of highlighting because it's good to keep in mind. Uh, if you have a, 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 a if, if C is a proper curve, it's automatically projective. This is also in Hartshorn, at least the smooth case is in Hartshorn and you can reduce to that easily. Uh, and then just, and the second fact here, just to, is, uh, I'm not, I, I haven't proven this I, and I, I don't think I'll even use it, but it's nice to know that if you replace scheme in the definition of a curve with an algebraic space, it doesn't change uh, as long as it's separated. So if you have a separated pure one-dimensional algebraic space, then it's automatically a scheme. And for uh, arbitrary integral curves, we have sort of this riemann roch theorem, which is an easy consequence of so it's just a co of cohomology that you can compute the Euler characteristic in terms of the degree and the, and the genus. 
But the, the Riemann rock, Riemann rock really becomes powerful when combined with Sayer duality. And for, so Sayer duality uh, says that the sheaf of differentials is a dualizing sheaf, you know, and since C is smooth, this is, this is a line bundle. And we often write like omega C as the sheaf of differentials on the curve because it is, it is the dualizing sheaf. And just to remind the dualizing sheaf is something that, uh, well, so that, you know, satisfies the, 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 the natural pairing satisfies their duality, like, yeah. In this context, like for instance, yeah, what it tells us is that like in particular H1 of a line bundle is then identified with H0 of omega C for the tensor L dual. And therefore, if you combine the Sayer duality with, with the Riemann rock, you get this identification, which is a particularly useful form. And I, I should say, even for smooth curves, Sayer duality is a, is a deep theorem. Uh, yeah, there's, there's really no, yeah, it's kind of, it takes work to prove no matter how you approach it. Uh, and, and then so yeah, using, using uh, Riemann rock and, and Sayer duality, we can get nice conditions for what, whether line bundles on smooth curves uh, are positive. And, and so this is um, on the right hand side here. So if you take a smooth projective curve, then we have like, if, if the degree is negative, then there's gonna be no global sections. If the degree is positive, it's automatically ample. So this easiest ample criterion is on, on smooth curves. But then if the degree is one, once it's two, two G, you know, it's base point free. And then once it's even one more, one larger, you know, it's very ample. So uh, let's, let's just assume C is, is geometrically connected over K, over K. And then uh, if the genus is at least two, we can use Sayer duality and Riemann rock to, to, to calculate the global, global sections. So the global sections of omega C of this, this either dualizing sheaf or the sheaf of differentials uh, by Sayer duality is H1 of C of OC, which was by definition the genus. And similarly, H1 of, of omega C is identified with H0 of C of o, omega C. And because C is connected, that's just one. And then if you apply Riemann rock, apply to omega C, uh, you get that H0 of omega C minus H1 of omega C is equal to the degree plus one minus G. And that allows you to compute the degree of omega C as 2G minus two. In particular, it's always ample by this positivity criterion, but it's not always very ample. And so there you need to consider powers of the, of the, of the dualizing sheaf. Uh, so for K greater than one, we can do the analogous calculations that H zero of omega C tensor K is 2k minus one, g minus one, that there's no h1, and uh, it, it, its degree, well, it's just k times the degree of omega c, so that's k times 2g minus two. And this implies that omega c tensor k is variable if k is at least three. Okay, next thing I want to remind you is fa what families are of smooth curves. Uh, a family of smooth curves and uh, is, a, is a smooth and proper morphism. 
such that every geometric fiber is a is a connected curve of genus G. Necessarily smooth because yeah, because the, the morphism from C to S is smooth. And uh, there's always this this uh, line bundle. The sheaf of differentials, the relative sheaf of differentials, is always a line bundle, and this and and it sort of has behaved well that you know restricts under any base change, but in particular if I restrict to the to, to a point. So if I take this relative sheaf of differentials and restrict to the fiber over a point over a point S, then this is identified with the sheaf of differentials of this curve S over the residue field. And one of one thing that we sort of used repeatedly in our arguments for MG already, namely that when, when we showed that MG was an algebraic stack, uh, we, we, we used the following property of families of smooth curves that, uh, that the sheaf of differentials, um, that, that, yeah, the relative sheaf of differentials, that the, at least the third power of it is, is relatively very ample because that could be checked on fibers. Um, and moreover, like the, the cohomology and base change allow us to conclude that the push forward was a vector bundle. All right. Yeah, that's my quick recap on curves. We're now gonna move to, to nodes. But I'll pause for questions. Okay, so what are nodes? So, uh, so we'll start with a curve over a field, not, al not necessarily algebraically closed, but if it is algebraically closed, we say that a point is a node if the complete local ring is isomorphic to this, to, to uh, yeah, this power series ring. And here, just to remind you that we, we're gonna use the completion uh, a lot. This is just the limit of the, the thickenings of the maximal ideal. And in general, uh, you know, if, 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 if K is not algebraically closed, essentially between, because like quadratic polynomials may not factor over that field, the, the complete local ring may not have such, this, such a nice structure uh, so the way you define a node is to say that there's just a node over the base change to the algebraic closure. And I think you've all, you all know this, but this just like say like the, the algebraic picture of a node is just a curve that intersects itself transversely. So this is sort of the algebraic like one dimensional picture. Uh, but if you want to view this complex analytically, then it looks like a node sort of looks like like what happens when you take like a loop of a Riemann surface and, and pinch that loop to a point. So you, where like the node is, uh, are these points here. Okay, so that, that's the definition of a node. And so one of the first things you need to show is that uh, I'll leave this as an exercise. Uh, is that if P and C is a node and we're over a field that's not algebraically closed, then there exists a, a finite separable field extension uh, and a point P prime in the base change uh, over P Such that if you if I take the complete local ring of this curve C K prime at P prime, then it 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 has this nice form. So in the, in the definition of a node, we knew this was over happened over the algebraic closure, but you can then go to a finite separable extension. And uh, we also have the following you very like very uh, 
nice characterization of nodes is that I'll also leave it as an exercise. That if you have a point of C is a node, then you can find in a tau neighborhood of C, so this is a tau, and a point U over P, uh, and so that is also a tau over the the planar node. So this is just the the plane curve sitting inside A two, which is the union of the two axes. And you could find in a tau neighborhood here, such that this point U goes to the origin in A two. Um, and um, I leave this as an exercise because it's either a nice an application of Artin approximation, uh, or you can you can also do this uh, uh, directly without Artin approximation. But I I, I don't want to cover it right now because we're going to prove a relative version later. But if you if you remember back at my you know motivation for the atal topology, this was sort of one of one of the, the motivating factors is that uh, is that you can split branches of, of nodes in the atal topology. All right. Moving on, like uh, I want to give you the, the formula for the how you compute the genus of a nodal curve. So suppose you have sort of a curve that looks like this in the right hand side. So this has in one of those exercises. Question. Sure, go ahead. In the exercises on the previous slide, there was uh, the algebra. The first exercise, algebra of series, algebra of formal series in K. Is that supposed to be K prime, or should that be the original field of K? Oh, right. That should be K prime. Thank you. Yeah, and here in this curve, in this case. C, C is defined, yeah, over K. Right, that, that's a K prime. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so, so let's suppose we have a, a curve uh, C that's connected, nodal, and projective over an algebraically closed field. And then we let P1 to P delta be the nodes. So D delta is the number of nodes. In this, in this example, delta is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And uh, let's let C1 to C mu be the, be the irreducible, irreducible components of C. And uh, so mu is the number of irreducible components. In this example, it's four. And then we have GI be the genus of the normalization of these components. So in this in this example, uh, you know maybe this is G1, G2, G3, and G4. So th these numbers are indicating like the the geometric genus, the genus of the normalization. And and so let's to compute now the the total genus. So yeah, this the C tilde denotes the normalization. Uh, so let's take the, norm, the, the, the normalization of C. And we know this is a disjoint union of these curves C, I, C tilde I. And we're going to use sort of the exact sequence. So we know that the that OC and the push we know that this the normal the normalization map is bi is birational right it's an isomorphism over the complement of the nodes so that there and and the, and the quotient of of this map is sort of just the direct sum of the residue fields of the points pi and there and therefore just taking the the standard long exact sequence uh, you get the following long exact sequence, H0 of C, O, C. I'll just write it out. Uh, 
And then there's no H1 in the final term because it, it's a sheaf with dimension zero support. And so we just look at the dimensions of these components, right? So we're assuming C is connected. So this is one dimensional. C tilde is, is not necessarily connected. It's, it, it's, it's, it's the number of connected components is precisely the number of irreducible, irreducible components of the original curve. This is mu. Uh, and here we're taking the direct sum over all the nodes. That's delta. Uh, this is the, the dimension of this is the definition of the genus of C. And since C tilde is the disjoint union of these C tilde's i's, this is the sum of GI's. And so putting this all together tells us that the genus of C is the sum of the geometric genus of the components plus delta minus mu plus one. And so in this example, on the right hand side, if we compute the genus, let's see, we take the sum of the components, six plus one plus four plus zero. And then I'm adding in delta, subtracting mu, and then adding a one. Uh, and this is seven, 11 uh, plus four, 15. And note that, uh, yeah, and that you can also use this picture to kind of come up with a nice, a nice, uh, maybe, a, yeah, a way to compute it like uh, very, very quickly is that if you just look at like the number of the, the, the connected regions here. So there's this region, this region, this region, and this region. There's four of these regions. And, so, and the genus is exactly that number plus the sum of the, the ge geometric genus of the components. Six plus one plus four plus four. Okay, I think this may be familiar to many of you, but it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's nice to recall. Uh, and the next thing we want to discuss is yeah, the dualizing sheaf for noble curves, which is a technical but important notion. Are there, are, are there questions before I move on? Are we assuming pretty much always the curves are generically reduced? Um, Yes. Oh, I, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, I, a nodal curve. Well, yeah. I, I guess I didn't define precisely what I mean by a nodal curve. But, but when I mean when I say a nodal curve, I mean a curve over a field uh, such that all of the points are either smooth or nodal, and that implies that it's it's not even not only ge geometrically reduced but but reduced. Yeah. But that's a good question because. We will we will need to discuss uh, non-reduced curves and families of, of possibly non-reduced curves where where the, the reduction is nodal. Other questions? Okay, so we're on to the dualizing sheaf. So I mean, a, a nodal curve, if you think about what the, the defining property of a node, uh, it's a nodal curve is necessarily a local complete intersection. And you know, if you've read Hartshorn, uh, Hartshorn's exposition of shared duality, you know that automatically implies that there's a dualizing sheaf, a sheaf omega c that satisfies shared duality. Uh, but uh, but we kind of yeah, but we we would like to get a more explicit description of this in the case of a nodal curve. So, that, so that's what we're after right now. And, and, and we, yeah, and, and the reason we want this is because the, the dualizing sheaf for a nodal curve will be a line bundle and will play the role that the sheaf of differentials played for smooth curves, right? This will give us a, a, a line bundle that when we take a sufficient power, will give us a, uh, an embedding into projective space and so we can, we can use this. So we, to define it, we defined it in terms of it, the normalization. So we consider the normalization. Oh. C tilde over C, let's call that pi. And let's call sigma the singular locus of C. 
Oh, I shouldn't use script. So this is just the set of nodes. And let's take uh, pi inverse of, wait, let's take, uh, yeah, the preimage, let's, let's just let sigma tilde be the preimage. So our, our picture looks like this. This is just the case where we have one node and then our normalization. And then uh, there's two preimages of this one point. And in general, like let's use the notation that if zi is a node, well, well we have two preimages, pi and qi over zi. So here may have maybe a p and a q over a z. And so we're going to define the omega c using the sheet of differentials on the normalization. Uh, and we actually consider, so let's consider this, this exact sequence. I, so I have the sheaf of differentials on the normalization, and I could also twist that by the divisor uh, sigma tilde, right? Remember, c, c, c tilde is a smooth curve. And sigma, this is just a, a divisor. And the quotient is the structure sheaf of sigma tilde. And we can write this as just the direct sum, um, let's just say of all points y in sigma tilde of this residue field of y. And we can think about this twist um, as, you know, note that we, you, if you, you're twisting by a divisor. So if you take this twist, this omega c tilde twisted by sigma tilde, uh, if you restrict this to the complement of, of sigma tilde, then it's isomorphic to omega c. So the, these, yeah. So what, so you can interpret sections of this as as sheaf as the sheaf of meromorphic, or maybe I should say rational sections of omega c with a pole of order at worst one. And then what this map does, it just takes a section uh, and it, if you evaluate it at a point Y, uh, you get the residue, well, let's just, you can even, yeah, you get the residue of the section S at the point Y. And if you want, you could, you could take this as the definition of the residue. Uh, and and for, so for instance, you know, if you, if you had a section S such that all the residues were zero, then in other words, then there's no poles and your section is, is not just rational, it's, it's, a, it's, it's it, 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 it is a section of, of the sheath of differentials, the regular section. Right, okay. So we have this and, and then we define Let's define the subsheaf omega c. So we don't know, yet know it's a dualizing sheaf. We're just defining this as an abstract subsheaf of the push forward of omega c tilde twisted by sigma tilde. And uh, find on an open set in c tilde. Oh no, sorry, it, it lives on C. So, so for an open set V in C, we set the global sections of omega C as the subsheet of, of as, this, uh, as sections S on inverse of V with the following property that for all nodes, ZI in sigma, that the sum of the residues at pi, at one of the preimages, plus the other one, is zero. All right, that's our definition of, as as a subsheaf, and sort of the definition implies that there's two exact sequences that are quite useful when computing 
I mean, the, yeah. The first definition is that we is essentially the, yeah is the definition that we have omega c sitting inside the push forward of of this um, where this map takes a, a section s to the differences of the residues. Is that okay? And then and the second one was that is that uh, that the this is contained in the sheaf of differentials, and that the sheaf of differentials is precisely the the enlargement such that where a section here s goes to. Yeah, just the residue at PI, which is same, yeah, which is the same as the residue at QI of S. So the, the sheaf of differentials, you know, sits in between the push forward of the twist of the sheaf of differentials of the normalization and just the push forward of the sheaf of differentials. All right, and now we need to get to some of this and some of its defining and well, some of its important properties. Um, right, so moving. Uh, you know, let me let me just copy this definition so that we don't lose it. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Can, can I ask you something? So, what uh -huh. what is the first the first map in the second like that sequence? What is the first map here? Like the, the this map? No, in the second like that sequence. The second. Sequence, the first one. one. The first one. Oh, uh, well, I, I, uh, okay. I, well, I think it, it comes from the fact that every, if you have a regular sheet of differential, if you have a regular differential on the normalization, um, then, you know, then it's also a section of omega C. By 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 defin by definition, right? If there's yeah, if you look at it follows for, yeah from this definition here that if you that if you have s if if it's if oh it's, sorry sorry uh, yeah yes that makes sense okay, okay. thank you sorry right so I, I recall here we have the definition again just just to uh, keep it on the on the same page. Um, and I want to do one example, and this is actually yeah this this is seems to Seems like a very simple example, but in fact, everything can be reduced to this. So let's take let's take a planar singularity. Let's take the union of the two axes inside A two. So this is just, uh, and let's take its normalization, which is going to be the union. of two axes. So here we have a singularity and the normalization is just two copies of A1, right? We have one, one singularity, which is zero, and its pre-image is, let's just call them P and Q. Um, and let's realize that, uh, that K, X, Y, that the induced map on, on, on rings here, that this is the subring of functions f, x, and g of y that agree such so whose value such that when you evaluate them uh, at zero, they're identified. All right, a function on the normalization des descends to the nodal curve if the evaluation at P is equal to the evaluation at Q. Okay. And so maybe an example of a differential would be let's let's let uh, let mu be uh, dx over x minus dy over y. This is certainly an example of a global section because the residue of the of 
of this is, is one and the residue of this is minus one. But let's suppose we have an arbitrary, if let's suppose we just have an arbitrary section f of x dx over x and then a g of y dy over y. And let's put a minus sign here just, yeah, uh, I suppose this is a global section. So any, any global section can be written of this form because we know the poles are at worst order one. Um, and uh, right, so this, uh, let's, let's, let's realize that this, this differential in fact, is, can be written uh, as, I claim that this in fact can be written, this is equal to if I, if I, let me write it this way. Times mu. Um, hold on, hold on. Okay, let me take a step back. Uh, okay. So, uh, let me. So yeah, note that it, 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 if we have, okay, if we have this differential here, then necessarily the defining feature is that the res is that the, the residues are opposite. So what that means is that then f of zero equals g of zero. So this is exactly the condition that the functions f of x and g of y uh, on the normalization descend to a function on the curve. And what, the, what it descends to is precisely, you know, this function here. So then, yeah, so, so this differential then is, uh, these two are equal. Ah, oh, this is, okay. These are equal. <laughs> and okay, and what that means then is that, uh, is that omega C on this curve is isomorphic to OC with, with generator uh, mu. Or new, sorry. Yeah. So in this basic example, you can write down exactly what the uh, the sections of, of the dualizing sheaf are, and uh, and you and you just show directly that it's uh, that it's this, that this sheaf is trivial and with with generator given by new. All right. And, and so why is that so important? It's be, well, it's because we know it's how locally all nodes look like this. So this, this, so this is, is the important calculation. And then you can use, to then, but then you need to know that if you have an tau cover of a curve, then that the, the dualizing sheet pulls back. So I leave this as an exercise, but the, the fact you need to know is that normalization commutes with uh, a tau maps. So it's, yeah, once you know that, it's, it's just a simple consequence. And therefore, because we know nodes at how locally look like this, uh, we get that omega C is always a line bundle on a nodal curve. And to put, and then maybe the most important fact is that the way we've defined omega C is the dualizing sheaf. So, uh, so the exercise is to use Sarah duality For smooth curves to show that omega c is a dualizing sheaf. I think there's no way to directly prove it. Every, I mean, siderality for smooth curves is a deep result. And I think the easiest way to, to get at this is to reduce it to that using properties of the normalization. Any questions? So it's just a property of normalization that every node has two pre-images? Yeah. Yeah, exactly.
Right, the last property we need is the local structure of nodes, and I want to do this in families. So this is, uh, yeah, this is the last part of today's lecture. And uh, to, to, to begin, so I have the desired statement on the right hand side, but uh, in order to motivate it, let me just, let's just recall like the local structure of, of, of smooth points of curves. And yeah, and uh, so suppose we have a smooth family of curves. And then if you have a point, any point, then, the, then a tau locally on S and on the total family C, uh, it looks like uh, just, just, uh, just A1. So maybe I point out that this is commutative. It's not necessarily Cartesian. You, you, you need, may need to take, you, this is a statement that's it's a, a tau local, you have to take a tau covers both on the base and on the source. But then it's then the C prime is a tau over A1 over S. And so this, this is, you know, relative affine space, you know, dimension one. And, you know, it's also, it's also the pullback of just the map from A, A1 Z over spec Z. So, so, yeah, so hopefully this is, is a familiar fact. In fact, this, this follows just from the local structure of just smooth morphisms. Any smooth morphism uh, has, has such a structure. Any smooth morphism is a tau locally, this like equal to affine space of the corresponding dimension. All right. Quick question. Yeah. Um, so where does P show up? Is, uh, is S prime oh. just like a neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, so, so right, that's a good point. So uh, let, let me, so you have your point P in C, in C. There should, there should, yeah, there exists also a, a pre-image of this and this P prime should map to, to zero in here. Or the corresponding zero over the fiber of the image of p prime and s prime. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so we're, we're, we have an analogous result for the structure of, of nodes. So here we, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I haven't defined what a family of nodal curves is, so I'm just gonna state the precise hypothesis we have. So c to s Excuse me? is. Why did you choose in a tall neighborhood of, of c over s? Isn't it enough to take Zariski neighborhoods? For the smooth, like uh, it's, a so. over, it's a tall over, it's a tall over a one, but isn't it Zariski locally a tall like, like it's a oh, Zariski you're right. locally a, like it's Zariski locally uh, standard smooth. Yeah, good. Yeah, I think Ben's making the important point that there's even a stronger statement here, but I'm sort of stating it in a way that's just gonna yeah that's general uh, that will generalize. Oh, okay. I, I see. Will be in the same form for for nodal curves, but yeah, that's a good point. Is there is a stronger result that these maps, you can take them to be Zariski opens. Right, so, uh, so we, we're starting with a morphism pi, uh, and it's, it's a flat and finitely presented morphism such that every fiber is a curve. Uh, and, and I take a point P and C, which is a node in the fiber of CS. In particular, like by our definitions, like the, it's, it's a reduced point in the fiber. And then the, the conclusion is, is analogous that, uh, that, that there's a tau neighborhoods where this diagram again is, is commutative, but not necessarily Cartesian. We have a tau neighborhoods of FS and a tau neighborhoods, the total family C, which in turn is in a tau neighborhood of this particularly nice, uh, particularly nice uh, node, and yeah, like the, note that this here, this morphism, is the base change of sort of this universal family of nodes. along a morphism spec. So there's, there's morphisms from spec A to this where, where T goes to the pullback, where T pulls back to a function F in A. 
And so, yeah, this is defined F and A is a function not vanishing at S prime. At least is, this, is the statement, is the statement clear? So what we, we, we like the statement, well, it will imply, uh, yeah, it will imply number of nice properties. In particular, it allows us to know, you know, that the locus of, of nodes um, is an open condition and, and arbitrary family curves. And we'll, we'll then use that to know that like the, the, the substack of nodal curves and the stack of all curves is an open substack. So that, that's, that's why we want this statement. But hopefully the statement, like the, yeah, the statement is clear. All right, so I wanna end with maybe a sketch of the proof of this. There's a lot of ingredients in the proof, but I think I can wrap up, wrap it up in 10 minutes. Okay, so this is, this is the theorem we want. And, oh, and, and keep in mind that the very special case where like the base S is a field, you know, that, that if, if you, if you, that is then, uh, that was the statement we had earlier as an exercise of the local structure of, of a node of a curve. And our strategy uh, is as follows. So the first step um, is to reduce to the case that S is finite type over the integers. Uh, and so I know that in these hypotheses, like our morphism C of S is flat and fine, uh, and it's a finite presentation. And this is always sort of the hypothesis that you use instead of finite type in the non-Ethereum setting. And to reduce to this, you use a technique called absolute Ethereum approximation. It's, it's, it's very useful, especially in modular theory to reduce to the Ethereum case, to the Ethereum case. Uh, I'm not going to go th go through this right now because uh, I, I don't have the time. But it's it's yeah it's sort of it's, it's particularly nice in moduli theory and important in moduli theory because you know we're defining our stacks over the, the like category of all schemes. We can't just restrict to finite type schemes and Ethereum schemes. Uh, so you and so when you need to prove something about the stacks, often you need to prove something about an arbitrary family, possibly over a non-Ethereum base, and then so you need non-Ethereum methods. Uh, and and the, but the most common technique is just to reduce to the Ethereum case. And there's this uh, technique using absolute Ethereum approximation where the main idea is that like if S is an affine scheme, then the family of curve C, you know, it's, since it's finite presentation, it's only defined by um, finitely many equations and finitely many relations. So you only need finitely many elements of that ring of the coordinate ring of S. And, and, and so then you get this finitely generated uh, Z subalgebra of the coordinate ring. And, and basically your curve, family of curves lives over that. And that allows you to, to reduce. And your family, yeah, your family of curves is the pullback of that. Anyway, there's more to say there, but I'm not going to go into the details. All right, that's the first step. And then on the second step, we want to reduce to the case where the, the completion of the fiber is has that particularly nice form. So we want to reduce to the case that the complete, complete local ring at the fiber CS of P is isomorphic to this. And this follows by the way you show this is you apply the earlier exercise um, to conclude that there exists a, a separable field extension of the fiber, but then, and then, um, and you know, and a point P prime and C K prime, you know, with the, with the corresponding properties. Uh, and then you have to choose, you know, S prime, you have to choose an Italian neighborhood of S and the way you, and you do it such that you just choose an arbitrary Italian neighborhood such that the induced map on residue fields is the desired uh, such that that this is isomorphic to K prime over KS. 
So yeah, we know after a finite separable field extension, we can get the node in, in, the, in, the, in the standard form. And then you just choose in a town neighborhood that induces that separable extension of fields. And you can do that essentially by the primitive element of the of fields. You just adjoin one variable and then there's a yeah, mod out by that polynomial and shrink so that's a tau. Okay, that's step two. And now we have to go from the complete local ring in the fiber to the complete local ring at P. And this is one of the, the difficult steps and when you need to use formal deformation theory. And this is where Schlesinger's theorem plays a role. So I'm not gonna spell out what Schlesinger's theorem does in general, but in, in this context, if you apply it to the, to the local deformation functor of a node, uh, it says the following. It says that if you if you if you're given so we have our, our C at family C S, yeah. Let's let K S just be K for convenience. So we have our curve, and suppose you have some deformation of this, so some maybe spec B, some curve D over this a flat family, such that this is Cartesian, and B here, uh, it could be local Artinian, or it could be complete. Um, the, given that the Schlesinger's theorem implies that there exists, that this is a pullback of uh, t x y mod x y minus t. Of this of this family of curves with nodes. In, in other words, it says that every local deformation of a nodal sing singularity is the restriction of this particular one. Like this, this one dimensional deformation of, of the node captures all possible deformations. And then we apply this theorem. We apply this to, so here I have my curve. And I, I apply it to the, to, to the restriction of the complete local ring. And what it gives me is it gives me a morphism uh, to, well, let me, let me cheat, to here. Uh, such that, and T here then pulls back to some function F and since it was a node, this, this function f is non-zero at that point s. And the, the completion of this at this point is identified with the completion here. So you get, so this, this yeah, this, this completes the third step. So it essentially follows from, from Schlesinger's theorem, which we have not covered, but it's a, yeah. That's a nice topic that deserves deserve some attention, but we, yeah, we can't cover everything. All right, now putting everything together, and now we need is, 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 uh, is, is the following fourth step. So to remind you, I've written the theorem again so to remind you of what we're trying to prove. And we so far, we know that the complete local ring of C is, is, has, has, has this nice structure. And we, need to, and we need to go from the complete local ring to an etal neighborhood and we use the powerful result of Artin approximation. Artin approximation is a technique to go from properties of the completion to etal neighborhoods uh, that we covered in one of the earlier lectures. I recall the statement here and, and let, me, let me tell you how, how we apply it. So let define a functor F from schemes over S to sets where the scheme T over S goes to sort of all to, to the set uh, of diagrams. And where T maps to spec Z T and this maps to spec
and and so this is this is our functor and because c over s is locally a, is a finite presentation you can check that this functor is limit preserving and we know that over uh you know when if t is the completion of s we have an object over this i mean this is exactly what we kind of constructed over here And we have this, and in fact, if, let's just remove the completions. And so th this actually, this, this, this here defines an element sigma hat of F over O hat SS. And then R in approximation gives us the desired diagram that we wanted. Um, and uh, and then moreover, yeah, that that so that, that that gives us the desired diagram. And then to show that this is a tau, you use the fact that we know that. Um, I mean, yeah, note that R in approximation only gives us an approximation, right? You apply R in approximation with n equals two, but yet that's enough to conclude that this map is a tau because we we're, we're going to check that induces it. Uh, an, uh, an isomorphism of completions, we know that the two completions are abstractly isomorphic. Uh, and we know that the map induces an isomorphism mod the second power of the maximal ideal. And then you use the, this fact that, uh, you know, the Noetherian rings or surjective endomorphism of Noetherian rings is an isomorphism. And to sit, check that a map of complete local rings is surjective, it suffices to check on the, on the second power of the maximal ideal. Uh, but in the end, that, yeah, that guarantees a talentness and that gives us our local structure theorem relying on this powerful result of our approximation. <laughs>